Well, good morning and welcome to London. Today we're going to be talking at FS Club with uh, Lord Jonathan Marland, the chairman of the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council about Britain's growing role in world trade and how we can be using the Commonwealth advantage to increase trade for the benefit of all. Now, you'll know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Xi'an and I'm only able to do these webinars thanks to the tolerance, uh, may I say, and wide interests of our many, many sponsors around the world. So thanks to all of you for allowing us to range widely and freely across technology, economics and finance. And today we're certainly going to be looking at economics and finance. Now, as you know, my job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible so you can hear from our expert. Uh, and I'll do so in just a minute after I make uh, three uh, quick announcements. The first is that, yes, the slides are available. In fact, they're already up in the chat room. Uh, secondly, this is being recorded and the recording will be available in about two working days, so about midday on Wednesday, for you to share with friends and uh, family and colleagues over the weekend as you're at the Jubilee munching your popcorn and watching this again and again, I'm sure. Uh, and finally, uh, we are in fact going to be having a lot of Q&A uh, with Jonathan, so please type your questions in or comments or observations into the GoToWebinar chat room. I'm here with you, so emails and texts uh, won't be received. Uh, do tap them in. If we get a, a high number of them, or you'd like to say something uh, personally or connect with Jonathan, uh, all of the questions and uh, observations will be sent in, uh, with your email attached so he can get, get, get a hold of you. Those are sort of the formal announcements, but I thought it'd be interesting and fun to kind of sort of sound out the audience. Uh, we've got quite a few people online today um, uh, with two quiz questions, if we may. So uh, the first question is, what percentage of people under 30 in the world live in a Commonwealth country? And the answer may be surprising or not. Uh, so anyway, fingers on buzzers, please, as, uh, as behind the scenes, Sasha launches the poll. And we're asking you, what percentage of people under 30 in the world live in a Commonwealth country? 10, 25, 40, or 60? Uh, Jonathan, the audience here is normally very opinionated and, and uh, true to form. Over three quarters have voted, over 80% have voted. Uh, just leave that open for another second or two. And now we'll close and share those results with you. So, um, 40%. And Jonathan, as you know, the answer is? Yes. 60. <laughs> That's so an amazing figure, isn't it, Michael? Sorry, I, I didn't realize I was, I was on, sorry, yes. 60%. Yep. 60%, which is a, a surprising. Uh, so the Commonwealth is heavily biased out of 7.9 billion people, heavily biased uh, towards the youth. So I can cross out, cross out that statement I was going to make there, Michael, can I? <laughs> <laughs> you, you're what they call shot my fox. <laughs> That's it. The Commonwealth is where the future is. So, uh, and then we've got another poll here uh, about that population. So is it 1.1, 1.6, 2.1, 2.6, or 3.1 billion out of 7.9 billion? And again, as ever, Jonathan, our uh, very opinionated and self-assured audience of wonderful guests out there. They're voting a little bit more slowly this time, but only a little bit. Over 75% have now voted, almost over the 80, over the 80 mark. And I'm now just going to close that poll and share the results with you on that one as well. Um, oops. There we go. Ah, and here the audience is spot on, 44%. It is, in fact, you're right, 2.6 billion of the 7.9 billion people in the world live in a Commonwealth nation. So with that, uh, with that uh, warmed up for you, Jonathan, may I say the floor is yours? Well, Michael, thank you so much for having me on. And um, it's always a pleasure to see you. And uh, also thank you personally for support you've given our Commonwealth organization, which is the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council. And how appropriate it is today, or this week, shall we say, that we should be having a, uh, a webinar on uh, the Commonwealth, because as many of you will know, uh, the Queen celebrates 70 years on the throne, 70 years of head of the Commonwealth, and uh, it, that is in itself a magnificent achievement, and there she is, uh, at the Commonwealth uh, Chogham Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in London and Buckingham Palace, where I was privileged to be. For those that uh, 
don't understand the history, uh, in 1931, the British uh, Commonwealth of Nations was set up um, under the Balfour Agreement. And it was in 1949 that it was changed at the behest of India, funnily enough, uh, to become the Commonwealth of Nations. So the word British was dropped and it was India who drove that. And the amazing thing is there were eight nations who were members of the Commonwealth then. Um, Australia, I've got to now remember, Australia, India, obviously, New Zealand, uh, Ceylon as it was then, which is now Sri Lanka, Canada, United Kingdom, Pakistan, and uh, there was one other I've missed, but I'll, I'll uh, Malaysia. And um, now it is this burgeoning group of 54 countries, as we say on our slide, that have uh, a, a common interest. It's, uh, they all march at different economic levels, but there is a commonality that uh, allows you to join the Commonwealth. That is that English is a, a principal language or common use of English. And secondly, uh, you have to be a democratically uh, elected country. And I think those two things are incredibly valuable. Obviously speaking, English is now the majority global language. But uh, democracy at this particular time, with the backdrop of the invasion by Russia of Ukraine, the Chinese infiltration, well, infiltration is an unfair world, but the Chinese uh, tentacles expanding so uh, vigorously throughout the world that it is uh, a real threat to our democracy. Uh, democracy itself is under pressure because many would say there is lack of leadership throughout the world and that uh, leaders have been forced into short-term thinking because they have always got their eye on the next election. So uh, with that and with the following other issue points that benefit the Commonwealth, um, I will set the scene. Um, I mentioned the subject as far as the United Kingdom is concerned. Uh, they have, in many ways, the government has been ashamed of its role in the Commonwealth. In some ways, for very good reasons. They consider it uh, that in certain places we had uh, ourselves had br brutal regimes in some of the countries. Uh, we had failed to leave them in an orderly manner. Some of them have been left with huge difficulties, which uh, many of them blame upon the, uh, the British, I think, uh, in most cases, fairly unfairly. Uh, and so the Commonwealth has been uh, a thorn in the side of the British government because it's failed to grasp the fundamental benefits that exist. However, with Brexit, you would have thought, that it, it, this is in bra brackets, uh, the, the, there would be a fast charge towards the Commonwealth, uh, close brackets, but uh, there in fact has been a very slow burn to it. And there is now a gradual awakening by the British government that the Commonwealth has value. Why does it have value, Michael? Uh, I've mentioned the Queen, soft power. The Queen is uh, clearly uh, so revered throughout the world, as are many of the royal families, and happily her successor, the Prince of Wales, is very well thought of throughout the Commonwealth. This is incredible soft power for the United Kingdom. The language mentioned earlier, soft power. Education. So many Commonwealth countries have shared education uh, systems, have uh, had their uh, families and, 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 and themselves educated in the British education system and further education system, which includes obviously science, medicine, etc. And there is a wealth of Commonwealth countries, uh, of citizens represented in the UK have, who've continued to live here. Soft power. Sport. Uh, we, we invented so many sports that are now paid across the Commonwealth that allow Commonwealth nations to join together so frequently to pay sport. And of course, the English rule of law, which perpetuates largely throughout the Commonwealth. There are one or two exceptions, but that gives you an incredible use of soft power. 
And on that subject, one of the things that we started recently at CWEIC was the Commonwealth Law Council or Legal Council, which now has uh, 25 members, I think is the latest figure, of uh, independent law firms throughout the Commonwealth uh, who've been able to create this trading link of uh, clearly shared legal principles, but also uh, being able to utilize that network uh, to support their clients when they uh, when they um, open or when they trade in Commonwealth countries. So the Commonwealth advantage for Britain is not is that, and that equates to, as we say at the top of our slide here, a 21% cheaper basis of doing business because you don't have to have interpreters. There is a system that's already set up for um, providing law, accountancy, and practices that are based on the British system. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the best system, but it is based on the British system and um, through uh, these shared soft power uh, initiatives. And of course, it's uh, soft power, not just for Britain, it's soft power for all the other work, all the other Commonwealth countries for those very reasons that I've enunciated. So where does this uh, leave this sleeping giant of uh, Britain uh, in its uh, current independent, non-affiliated state, having left the United Kingdom? Well, it leaves it with a mass of opportunity, and uh, that opportunity will uh, will expand during the next six months. Not least because we have the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, which is going to be in uh, Rwanda, where um, the Prime Minister will head over, uh, will hand over as head of the Commonwealth to the Rwandan government. Um, and the Rwandan government are seeking Britain's continued support and uh, uh, and a guiding hand in terms of the Commonwealth. Of course, uh, Britain has, has created this well-publicised immigration uh, relationship with Rwanda, which means they'll be working even more closely uh, nation to nation, and that, in a sense, shows the Commonwealth advantage. We then have the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, which uh, uh, will be the second biggest sporting event uh, of the year. Uh, well, not of the year, it is the second biggest sporting event after the Olympic Games. Complete sellout, um, uh, as we know. This will be a huge gathering, which around it we will be with the UK government hosting a Commonwealth. Uh, business forum. And then finally, uh, with the support of the UK government, we will be hosting, and particularly with the support of the City of London, Michael, your organisation, um, a, uh, a Commonwealth business forum uh, and a, with a, the emphasis on finance at the Guildhall in early December, of which we will be hosted by uh, your fantastic other organisation, the City of London. So these are uh, key events which will allow Britain to uh, showcase and uh, in particular reinforce the benefit of the Commonwealth and also to um, foster this extraordinarily important uh, development that now needs to occur with our nations that is trade, business and financial activity. If the world is going to emerge from the horrendous uh, troubles of COVID and the supply chain impact of um, COVID plus the supply chain impact of the war in Ukraine, it will need to cooperate much more closely together than it has done in the last few years. And therefore, this soft power relationship that exists within the 54 countries, which will have a three times opportunity between now and the end of the year to reaffirm its uh, relationship. Um, it it prevent, presents a great opportunity. Add to that that in Africa, they have de de decide, determined to create a free trade zone, which will be based in, well, is based in Ghana. Uh, we can see that the importance of free trade, which is one of the key things of the Commonwealth, and the 
the um, relationship uh, between these 54 countries that I've mentioned earlier will present a framework for which these figures of 21% uh, trade advantage can be put to full use and the population uh, that your panels, your, your attendees correct, got correctly right, like this huge population can create a dynamic and purposeful uh, future. Your, your other question, Michael, was uh, relating to uh, the youth in uh, the Commonwealth. And this is an extraordinary figure, is it not? That 60% are under 30. And therefore, we have a, 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 a an opportunity to uh, create employment for these this uh, burgeoning figure. But we have a duty to uh, create a world in which they can uh, find employment and um, and um, a future because it is such a significant figure and therefore efforts by our organization which uh, is the business and trade organization of the commonwealth does have a focus on youth uh, and how we can create employment for the youth and how we can uh, create education for the youth and that's why working with the commonwealth association of universities which we do closely and other organizations to create a platform where they can achieve jobs and employment. In, 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 to finish, Michael, because I'm sure there will be a few questions. Um, if the United Kingdom cannot take advantage of this no-brainer, I call it, of opportunity to create trade and business, uh, then surely the United Kingdom are in a more difficult place than I thought they were before this particular webinar. It is uh, an amazing alliance uh, of, of, of countries. There are many countries that still want to join, uh, plenty in the Middle East which have had um, uh, British influence over time, for example. And I think now is an opportunity for the UK to really turbocharge its efforts and, and work with the Commonwealth countries and realize uh, for once uh, in the last 20 years, it'll be the first time in the last 20 years, that this is not the answer to Brexit, but an opportunity um, to uh, find markets and develop markets and to support those nations which aren't uh, in, 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 in our rather arrogant way in the first world status that we think we are, uh, support those nations to um, prosper because free trade delivers people out of poverty. This is a well-known proven fact and that's why Africa is taking it so seriously. And uh, with free trade, we have countless opportunities. So I think I've said enough, Michael, and if your audience is still awake, and yours too. Well, I can see you're awake. Um, I'd love to um, take any questions if there are any. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. Yes, there are actually a lot of questions here. So do folks get your questions in quickly if uh, you want. Uh, just a couple of things before we warm up. I mean, Jonathan, you've put a tremendous amount of personal effort behind the Commonwealth Enterprise Investment Council, you know, a, a lot of support. You're passionate about it. Could you tell the audience just, you know, in 60 seconds, what does CWEIC do? Well, CWIC is responsible for um, the trade and business, as I alluded to, in the Commonwealth, promoting it and developing it. We are a network organization, business to business, business to government, government to business. And of course, in some countries, government is very close to business. Uh, there is a, a very uh, close alliance and relationship. Uh, not so much in uh, the United Kingdom, believe it or not, and, and, and um, in, in Canada and Australia, etc. And therefore, the business to business, business to politics bit is extremely relevant. Now, one of the interesting things about the Commonwealth is that it it is a living, uh, vibrant beast. A couple of countries have left, Ireland and Zimbabwe. Um, but I think one particular point of note was that Mozambique, was the first country to be admitted without any former colonial or constitutional links. And of course, uh, 
course, Rwanda uh, also uh, coming in, I think it was about uh, 2009. So, and you alluded to the former, or sorry, to, to a potential uh, set of prospective members, whether it's uh, Somaliland, South Sudan, Suriname, Burundi, I, I know are all being talked about. Um, do, do you see any limits to the growth of the Commonwealth? Could it become a, a United Nations of, of sort of people of like-minded trade in a world 100 years from now? Uh, I don't see limits. Um, I think it's fair to say, you, you refer to Mozambique, um, that was a deal done by um, Nelson Mandela and Margaret Thatcher. Uh, it's amazing the persuasive powers of Nelson Mandela that he could persuade Margaret to do it, because obviously Mozambique it, it is not really a British, uh, as you say, it doesn't really fit into the uh, criteria that already existed. But no, nonetheless, the uh, rules were bent to uh, include them. I think that there is no limit, and there should be no limit, for countries that support democracy, where British uh, or the English language is um, a, a prevalent language, and where there, is, where, where there are these shared uh, uh, um, ties that exist. And particularly in the Middle East, I mean, if you think about Kuwait, it was a dependency in many ways. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, I was with the High Commissioner last week, they, they're very keen to join. Uh, and um, why should they not be considered? They fit very nicely into that criteria. They actually have a parliament, unlike a lot of Arab states, so they are a democratically elected parliament. Uh, well, we, we do have quite a few questions. Just to follow up on that one, a little bit out of turn, but Vladislav uh, Dobrokotov uh, is curious about uh, some other countries. Uh, for example, what would you think of, of, of Finland and the Nordics joining? Is that a possibility? Well, I don't think they've, uh, I, I, it, 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 this is above my pay grade, of course, Michael, so um, this was, is entirely a personal opinion. Um, I don't think they fit that criteria uh, that um, have already been mentioned. However, we have a very strong association with Scandinavia. In fact, in fact we have um, uh, a, uh, in Finland, we have a, um, the, the, Commonwealth Finnish Association are members, so we there's no reason why they shouldn't be involved from a trading point of view, and in fact are, but whether they become full paid up members of the Commonwealth, that is not for me to decide, but uh, it sounds like the criteria, if you apply that criteria, uh, which may of course change, uh, then they wouldn't um, satisfy it. Um, I've got a couple of questions. It's Jubilee week, so uh, <laughs> not surprising. There are a couple of questions about Her Majesty. Uh, Bob McDowell, who's dialing in from Alderney, is curious, how important is the UK monarch in providing the glue to the Commonwealth link? Uh, might just start there. There are a couple more questions I'll, I'll pass on in a minute. Well, absolutely fundamental. Um, she has, uh, well, she, um, you know, she's been exemplary in her energy. Um, I've obviously had the privilege of uh, being presented on a number of occasions and her eyes completely light up when you mention anything to do with the Commonwealth or you're involved with the Commonwealth. It's, it's like, um, you know, she changes personality. She loves, um, loved traveling the Commonwealth and of course her first trip abroad, I think I'm right in saying, as um, before she was, um, became queen was to Canada and then subsequently Kenya where she uh, discovered that she was going to become queen. And these had a real impact on her because, um, you know, it was like sort of, uh, uh, she was 21, 22 at the time, I think. And, um, you know, it was like sort of going into a new world and discovering another country and, and, and everything that goes on in those countries and actually the incredible love and affection uh, they had for her. So she's an incredibly important glue. Uh, Chogham in London was thought to be her last Chogham, which uh, is almost certainly true. Uh, every head of state, nearly every head of state came to Chogham uh, in London because they realized that it may be her last and wanted to pay tribute. Uh, and um, she has been extraordinary in the way uh, that she's 
she has um, carried the Commonwealth with her, kept it together single-handedly because, as I say, she's had very limited support by the UK government, really has, but she's uh, carried that on and uh, I strongly believe the Prince of Wales will be a, an excellent um, follower. Uh, a slightly um, uh, ringing tone here. Uh, Charlotte from New Zealand is asking, do you think, though, that more countries might look to uh, become a republic when the Queen passes? And might that also mean that they would think about leaving the Commonwealth? Well, Charlotte, um, uh, I don't know what time it is in New Zealand, but you're obviously, if it's, if it's late, you're obviously staying up in preparation for the opening balls of the Test match on uh, Thursday. Um, so, uh, and I wish you well. Well, I don't wish New Zealand well for the next, uh, for the remainder part of this week, because I hope we, for once we might win a Test match. But um, th this is a a, a, a very a, a very good question. I, I have to say, um, I'm always amazed that uh, countries still have the Queen as their head of state. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's sort of it, it's an amazement to me, and uh, and I, I I'm also amazed when the result comes out when they have a vote on it that they want to keep her. I think there is a very compelling reason, of course, for having a non-politically affiliated person as a head of state, uh, because you know you just end up with more and more elections, more people running for posts, some turning out to be suitable, some turning out to be unsuitable. And therefore, having um, a a person who is uh, head of state for a, a long period is, is compelling. Um, I, it would never surprise me if a, if a nation decided and voted that they no longer wanted the queen as the head of state. Um, and clearly, her passing would create an opportunity for people to revalue that. And I understand it. The media have this mistake, make this mistake of, uh, of mixing head of state and the Commonwealth. And they all think that just because, uh, and the recent one was Jamaica, perhaps does not want the Queen anymore as their head of state and wants to become independent, that they no longer want to be part of the Commonwealth. And I remember seeing recently the media headlines uh, that said Jamaica wants out of the Commonwealth when it's so wrong, and that's why their foreign secretary is trying to become secretary general of the Commonwealth. Um, so I don't think, um, uh, as an aside, that uh, a, a nation um, wanting to um, uh, no longer have the Queen as head of state means they don't want to be part of the Commonwealth. But from a New Zealand point of view, we don't hear enough of New Zealand in the Commonwealth. We don't see enough of you uh, engaged in the Commonwealth as far as our organisation is concerned. And I think as the Secretariat in general. So I hope that um, in the next few years, as we come out of this COVID period, that um, we'll see more of you engaged. Okay. We've got another question, believe it or not. Uh, this is from Bevan Killick. Bevan is in New Zealand uh, uh, as well. Uh, Bevan is uh, noting the strength of British diplomatic presence in the Pacific. What more can the Commonwealth and Britain do to support small Pacific Island nations that are getting cosy with China. Well, it's so right, and I put a paper to the Australian government twice, suggesting they set up a Commonwealth office so that we can um, use this soft diplomacy in addition to the Australian and New Zealand governments. And maybe we should set up the office in New Zealand um, uh, to uh, foster trade, business, uh, and the principles of uh, free trade and um, open and transparent business in association with uh, the key governments which are New Zealand and Australia. But I'm afraid to say uh, it hasn't had a positive response as yet. But I'm forever helpful, hopeful. I think the threat of China uh, is uh, hugely um, concerning. I think the uh, democratic countries have been asleep on their watch as has been um, shown by the recent development in the Solomon Islands. I've been to um, Tonga, Fiji, and uh, uh, one or two of the island states out there. And I was amazed in Tonga that uh, the parliament has been built by the Chinese. They've got by far the biggest embassy in Tonga. 
and seemingly we are allowing them to do it. Um, and uh, so all the forces of good have got to combine, which includes NATO, it includes the Commonwealth, etc., to uh, support these nations and to um, ensure that they carry on with the principles that we, as democratically elected, uh, democratically um, dwelling citizens, uh, enjoy. Um, we have a special uh, guest online at the moment, uh, Jeffrey Mount Evans, Lord Mount Evans, a uh, uh, former Lord Mayor of London as well. Uh, and he thanks you, Jonathan, for a great presentation. But uh, <laughs> a little bit more specifically, I'd like to know just a little bit more detail, What which areas of trade do you feel have the greatest potential, uh, A, between the Commonwealth countries as a whole, and B, for Britain? Well, um, obviously, I'm going to say maritime, Jeffrey. I hope you're smiling. Um, Jeffrey, uh, just as an aside, uh, uh, you were brilliant when you were Lord Mayor and came to Malta um, and uh, flew the flag there at Chogham at Malta, which I think reinvigorated the commitment the city showed to uh, the Commonwealth and saw the opportunity. And in fact, the city have led Britain in um, its understanding of the advantage of the Commonwealth. And I'm afraid, Geoffrey, we can lay that at your doorstep. So we're very grateful to you. I mean, the, the areas of, of trade uh, that I see um, that, that I see are, uh, are, are prevalent, are, as I mentioned earlier, I think an alliance of lawyers, an alliance of independent banks, an alliance of independent financial institutions is going to be the future for many of us. Uh, independent organisations now have to have global outreach. They don't want to open offices abroad and um, they need to have a loose alliance with partners. They also need to provide for their customers um, a, a lawyer on the ground, an accountant on the ground and a financial institution on the ground if they're going to set up shop in uh, those countries. So I see there being a great opportunity uh, there. The the immediate future, of course, is going to be the, chest, the, the, the elephants in the room, which are energy and uh, grain and, uh, and um, food production as a result of the uh, shock of the, um, the um, war in, uh, in Ukraine. And um, so quick fixes for um, supply of, of grain. Uh, etc. are going to be very, very important and we're working on that at the moment with Sri Lanka, uh, which is going through a real crisis as those who might have read and those from Sri Lanka are on the line, if there are any. Um, they can't get a decent, they can't afford to pay for a decent oil supply. They're going to have huge problems in uh, grain because uh, they've cut back their own production and those are two fundamental things that are going to confront every country. And each country is going to go into its own crisis. Uh, the small island states are coming out of, um, obviously, the, the cessation of tourism as a result of COVID, supporting the tourist uh, activity. And our organization was, I wouldn't say entirely responsible, but it was my letter to the prime minister and various lobbying of ministers to open the red list for Commonwealth small island states. As, given them a real, uh, gave them a real sort of lifeline for a moment. So I, I think it's it's going to, a long winded answer to Jeffrey's excellent question is, um, I think it's going to be a very much a moving target at the moment. It's going to be emergency support uh, and that's going to become very prevalent. Uh, Jonathan, moving on, um... I've got a couple of questions related to universities. So, uh, Clive Bullen is curious, you know, what are UK universities doing to get their education expertise out to the Commonwealth countries? And you, Purser, is picking up on a, on a particular point that the new high potential individuals visa system seems to exclude many African students' ability to access UK education. 
Um, I'll put a copy of the list uh, on the chat room here, but the, the list you know, does seem a bit sparse on on uh, African universities there. Any thoughts on those two, two questions? Well, yes. Um, the second question, yes, it is sparse on African countries. Um, and uh, because I think the criteria that has been established would exclude a number of African countries because of the level of qualification. Uh, and I'm afraid that's way above my pay grade, but that's uh, what it seems to be. In terms of the first question, you're absolutely right. Um, we're encouraging universities to cooperate uh, with Commonwealth countries. The Commonwealth um, uh, Association of Universities um, is, is now becoming a very active force. But in addition, we, for example, are working with um, Coventry University, which has tremendous expertise, as you can imagine, the automotive industry and uh, that sort of engineering side of things. Uh, we're talking them uh, with working with them about opening a campus in Ceylon or Sri Lanka, as it's now called. Uh, we're working with them in uh, another country. I'm trying to remember which one. I'm sorry. Uh, so a couple of um, very specific things going on there. Uh, clearly, universities have opened in Malaysia, Singapore, um, and others, which are uh, British universities, those are. Uh, and so their outreach and the recognition of the need for them to outreach is very high on a priority. Um, the other uh, area, of course, is schools. Um, and we've seen a lot of private schools opening in Commonwealth countries for the very reason that we enunciated area, earlier, you know, if, you, if there's English spoken, if there's a, principally an English education system, if there's uh, shared common values, then it's a no-brainer for many of the private schools to open in um, Commonwealth countries, and they've been very successful at it. Okay. Um, Christopher William, uh, Williams is asking a question. Um, about UK government's failings to abide by international law, or perhaps more accurately, the flirtations. Uh, do you see these uh, failings to abide by international law as likely to upset the Commonwealth? Well, uh, <laughs> everyone gets upset the whole time, don't they? Um, I don't think it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's not good, of course, uh, in that it destabilizes the principle of rule of law um, but I don't, I don't think that's the case. I, you know, in some ways, it's amazing that the Commonwealth still exists when you consider that the UK withdrew trade agreements from New Zealand, for example, to those New Zealand listeners on the line, um, and uh, tariffs were put on when we joined the EU, and it nearly bankrupted uh, New Zealand. It's a, to New Zealand's magnificent endeavour that they. Um, are now this extraordinary free trade successful um, business story. And I should just point out, Michael, that I don't operate for the UK government unless they pay us. I don't operate for the New Zealand government unless they pay us. We work for any of the 54 countries and uh, it, um, if they pay us. Uh, we do greater good things for the greater good of the Commonwealth, which is the business forums I've talked about. But uh, we don't. Uh, we we have no preference to one country or another. And in fact, it's fair to say we find the UK government utterly maddening to deal with, um, with their bureaucracy and and their process. So um, yeah, there, there are many more we'd rather deal with higher up the list. But I, I I just say that so that people don't think I'm speaking on behalf of the UK government, which I'm certainly not. Yeah, I think Hugh Purser has sympathy for you here. Is you know, soft power versus hard cash? You know, can a slow-moving UK government compete with China? Uh, interesting yeah. point. Um, yeah. Possibly it's a, a great, final. It's, it's, it's the very opposite. It's the very opposite point. And um, we've been asleep on our watch. Uh, America's been asleep on its watch. Uh, it is unbelievable to me that China now have control of ports in Jamaica. Uh, Barbados, uh, that they're building the port in Antigua right on the doorstep of the United States. It's absolutely amazing um, that uh, they've allowed it to happen if, well, if, if, if you take the view that America does on China. 
Yeah. Um, it just a sort of a, not, not a bad question to sort of come to a close on. It's from Bob McDowell again. You know, in what ways can the Commonwealth really override the, the challenges to globalization, which the world is now experiencing? Well, the truth is um, it can't. Um, it, it can it, it can only because it is a loose uh, arrangement and there are no legal ties that bind it together like for example the european union it it's not going to be able to use the institution of the commonwealth to uh make that happen but uh by the facility of the 21 percent figure that uh, we showed uh, on this slide that is so compelling that um, they will be attracted to trade intra commonwealth more than they will extra commonwealth so um, it, it will be a factor of that and and you know as well as i do although and i think most people on the line will know as well as i do that actually that old tenant uh, businesses do better when governments do lease uh, applies to those of us who've been in business all our lives. And that um, business is very quick to find an opportunity uh, to um, go and trade and sell and produce and all those sort of things, providing they have a framework with which they can do it. And I think that if the Commonwealth is going to survive, it's got to reinforce that framework, apply the rule of law, embrace free trade, and recognize all those advantages that exist. And I think it is well set for um, uh, a, a bright future. Well, that is an excellent manifesto. Now, you had a question you wanted to ask the audience, which I'm just launching today, but after listening to Jonathan, do you feel that the Commonwealth is still relevant today? Yes, no, or unsure? And, Christ. Uh, yeah, as ever, <laughs> you know, our audience is, is, is very... <laughs> I'm a bit worried about this one, Michael. <laughs> well, you're a politician, you're used to votes. <laughs> uh, here we go. Uh, three quarters of the audience have voted, and I think you'll be quite pleased with the result, which is uh, very much a, a yes or unsure, but certainly not a no. Uh, so oh, that's, great. that's a fantastic result there. Um, I must say there are a few things from, you know, from my perspective, I just kick in and I hope the audience are taking it away. Uh, twofold, really. I, I was down in uh, Djibouti of all places uh, late last year, and it was impressive how the prospect of joining the Commonwealth came up there again, you know, a former uh, French colony. Uh, and I'm so looking at this much more as a networking organization. I think the second thing is I, I had the fortune of participating in the technology stream at Chogham in the city. Uh, and I, I found that uh, intriguing because I had hitherto sort of seen the Commonwealth as much more a kind of, you know, canapes for ambassadors type function. And here we had <laughs> real people talking about real technology and linking up in particular on trade technology, the use of distributed ledgers, blah, blah, blah. It was a very, very good function hosted uh, by you. And I found that, uh, how that uh, rather moving. And finally, um, I, I just want to say that, you know, folks, if you want to get involved, uh, Commonwealth Enterprise Investment Council has been uh, really, really superb at making these sorts of connections over the years. A number of organizations with which I'm affiliated have joined it. And, uh, you know, those headline numbers, 54 countries, 2.6 billion people and 60% of the world's population under 30. Uh, are, are good reasons to get involved with the Commonwealth if you're anything to do uh, with, with world trade. And I think it's really on that note, um, I, I have to say uh, my quick rounds of thanks, if I could, to the audience. Great turnout today and excellent questions. Much appreciated. Um, do type in, I can see uh, people thanking you here in the Q&A. We'll send all those over to you, Jonathan. Uh, secondly, um, do uh, look at the website. Uh, we've got one more session tomorrow before we take a slightly extended weekend. For those of you outside of the UK, we have a two days bank holiday on Thursday and Friday, but we will be looking at a really important issue tomorrow, valuing the gig economy and some hard statistics on that. Um, but I must also, of course, thank our sponsors as ever, 
you do allow us to range widely and freely. But most of all, Jonathan, I need to thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we've been unable to figure out a technological means of giving applause. So I have here my non-Commonwealth Korean karma clapper, <laughs> which I use to simulate applause. Uh, but it's really, really kind of you to spend uh, some time this morning with us explaining the work that you're doing. And we really appreciate it. And uh, we're all behind you. Well, Michael, thank you very much for having me on. It's a real privilege as always. And um, I'm very glad of the result of that last poll. It shows that the, brain, the brainwashing is working. <laughs> All righty. Take care and have a good jubilee.